uh, a trade finance product by itself is is of little meaning you know today if i'm offering a supplier's credit to an uh, an exporter or a supplier of goods and services that is not sufficient because he takes the risk on his books and often times uh, these are micro small or medium enterprises so institutions across the globe need to look at taking measures and we are seeing some of that happen uh, but like i said you know the trade finance gap has increased so dramatically uh, we need to all come in together and take more measures to increase counterparty risk uh, to reduce i'm sorry counterparty risk by collaborating by taking risk on institutions that we have relative comfort on so this we are seeing increasingly happen financing mechanisms have been put in place uh, but i think a lot more needs to be done i'll take a pause here uh, ms shirotori uh, to see what we can uh, talk about next thank you mr sharma so um you know what kind of ideas are coming up in this kind of uh, the perspective in sort of you know sort of providing uh, better measures in support of breaching the trade financing gap for example can you share with us some innovative ideas from the india exim bank uh, thank you you know here uh, we've been looking at this subject now uh, particularly during the pandemic and said uh, as an eca our role is normally medium to long term exposed but as we studied uh, institutions and some of their practices we looked at the research gone in the increase in trade finance in the in the gap in trade finance we said why not look into coming and supporting this activity and i'll maybe come up and talk about uh, you know some of these areas that uh, you know we've been engaging in let me share my screen is it visible now okay uh so here uh, you know i spoke about uh, the uh, different kinds of uh, studies that have been done uh, i spoke about oecd but even icc for example says that 50% applications for trade finance by msmes are rejected that's a huge number it's very very significant also a 10% drop in bank intermediate trade finance is associated with approximately a 0.6% drop in imports and a 3.5% drop in exports at a global average level now this is very very significant now let me also put this in the context context of the sustainable development goals when we talk about sdgs you have seven out of the sdgs uh, which are related to trade that shows the great linkage that trade has on sdgs so we looked at uh, you know the various programs that multilateral banks and regional development banks have in place and we said why not come up with a program uh, by ourselves and look to support so we've called it tap which stands for trade assistance program and we've got uh, you know five key objectives the first and most important of those is to look at creating an enabling environment for counterparties in the settlement of trade transactions now this is absolutely critical if we're able to meet this one fundamental objective as institutions in this space i think we've met half our journey uh the other is a second is to look at looking at incremental trade in new and challenging untapped markets now often times what happens is uh, exporters or suppliers of goods and services keep going to traditional markets where they have been supplying and they are comfortable but how do we encourage these same uh, msmes to go into newer markets by covering their risk and and they having no recourse on the transaction so long as they meet their commercial obligations they should get paid Uh, also provide a an effective market entry mechanism while enhancing the geographical geographical coverage uh, for uh, companies particularly msmes risk coverage for challenging trade transactions now uh, this again dovetails very well with the role of ecs where we are lenders of last resort so can we take that little additional risk and provide cover for challenging trade transactions the answer through this program is yes and and finally looking at creating an ecosystem of banks uh, so what we've learned and believe now today is how do we develop these stable long standing partnerships between uh, banks uh, and develop these working relationships so that trade can increase so the idea here is for us is to look at uh, getting a range of commercial banks in india to develop partnerships with banks in overseas markets particularly challenging and uh, untapped markets Uh, so we've got uh, four different pillars under the program uh, the first is where 
we will look to either provide a guarantee or a confirmation on trade finance instruments that are issued by the buyer's bank in these markets. Uh, the second is uh, provide irrevocable reimbursement undertaking. This is something that we've learned very interestingly from some of our friends in the regional development bank space. Uh, the third is to provide uh, you know variety of guarantees for uh, supplies being made or even projects being executed. And during the pilot phase of this program, a very interesting transaction came up where uh, we were approached by a counterparty ECA from a partner country who said that their buyer is looking to charter a vessel, but no bank in India is accepting their guarantee. So we immediately stepped in and we said, yes, we will come in and, and, and uh, you know, front your guarantee so that the charter of the vessel is possible. And the final is to look at doing risk participation along with some of our partner banks and institutions across the globe. In terms of uh, you know, what we've done under the program thus far, so this is a newly minted, newly uh, launched program. In fact, we've not yet had the formal launch. Uh, we've done a soft launch and we've, in the first phase, uh, we've got a trade model that has identified 54 countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In the second phase, we hope to increase this uh, to more countries as we go along. Uh, we've also devised a country risk exposure limit model which includes seven quantitative and qualitative parameters. So as we've gone ahead, some of our stakeholders said, are we going to lose money here? So we said, no, we are going to go through a very calibrated risk approach and look to keep increasing exposure by enhancing the uh, uh, comfort of counterparties in a transaction. And the final is, of course, a risk uh, matrix for evaluation banks. So we've done appropriate risk weights uh, for each of those banks uh, uh, both in terms of quantitative and qualitative parameters. Uh, again, in terms of the model, this is uh, how something, so I won't get into too many details here, uh, but uh, before TAP was con conceptualized, we were seeing that there was no uh, counterparty which was looking to uh, mitigate some of the risk perceived in a transaction. And I'm using the word perceived because more often than not, it is the fear of the unknown in a transaction that forces people to abandon it. Uh, so I, I explained about you know, the four verticals or the four pillars that we have under the program. And we are hoping that with, with, with this, we've uh, already done a significant amount of pilot transactions on a daily basis. We are getting several referrals. And uh, we are hoping that this, again, becomes something very significant where we're able to contribute to you know, developing partner countries and help them uh, be a part of the global value chain. Uh, this again is a little structure on how it looks, one of the four pillars, but I won't get into the details here. I'm happy to answer questions on this. Uh, I'll, I'll pause here, Nishiro Turi, and uh, you know, take, take this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. It was extremely interesting, and uh, we really hope the successful launching of this uh, TAP. And what that just there are two points that really caught my attention and in terms of the potential value of such a program. One is that you said that the most of the risks are perceived risks. Sometimes that they think that trade financing can be a, such a risky business and they want to stay away from it. But you are suggesting that by providing reliable statistics and data and analysis, we can really clarify this kind of misunderstanding or misconception of the risks associated financing. Also, another thing that we thought, I thought quite interesting was that this one of the principles, five principles that you mentioned, you really want to encourage companies or firms to diverse, diversify their markets. And for your information, I think this is exactly what we are also looking at as the United Nations system, that in order to increase their resilience, economic diversification is a part of it. And Somehow, by continuing communication on these each other's activities and projects, we could probably one day make a confluence of our efforts, really, to have the maximum impact to support the small and medium scale enterprises in developing countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. Now, I'd like to move to Mr. Awami. I invite Mr. Awami. And I'd like to pose this question that is related to the challenges facing businesses in developing countries. Now, Mr. Awami, what are the challenges that 
traders and entrepreneurs, particularly in Nigeria, have been facing specific, particularly in the times like now that the economies are in crisis and uncertainty. Mr. Awami, may I invite you to take the floor? I thank you, uh, Ms. Shiratori. Uh, first of all, let me try and um, establish the context of financing gap in Africa and then focus on Nigeria. Now, according to uh, a survey conducted by the African Export Import Bank, Afrex Bank, in 2020, now Africa's trade finance gap stood at about $82 billion. Now, SMEs account for 80% of African private businesses and also 50% of African GDP. However, despite these huge contributions, their access to finance is limited. And um, from the Nigerian perspective, some of the challenges being faced by these SMEs or some of the problems of uh, accessing finance, first and foremost, can be traced to lack of awareness, especially uh, in the post-COVID era. A lot of intervention programs have been designed to help SMEs access finance from the Central Bank of Nigeria, from the Nigerian Export Import Bank, but there seems to be lack of awareness of the various sources of trade finance available to traders. Now, if they don't know about these uh, programs, that means they cannot even begin to access uh, the facilities. And then secondly, there's the issue of a lack of information on the SMEs themselves, because um, SMEs tend to have limited capacities and resources to engage in due diligence. Therefore, there is limited track record or experience uh, of the SMEs. Now, the absence of uh, credit history of these SMEs implies that banks have a more difficult task in appraising the credit risks of uh, these uh, SMEs and establish their credit worthiness. Now, a study by the African Development Bank in their trade finance survey uh, has showed that the most frequent uh, reason for rejection of trade finance application by banks relate to concerns about credit worthiness of the applicants. 36% of applications are rejected because the credit worthiness cannot be established and simply is due to lack of record or information that will enable uh, risk mitigation or underwriting the risk in those transactions. Again, another major challenge being faced by SMEs is the lack of adequate collateral. And it's also the second most reported reason for banks' rejection of customers' uh, trade finance requests. Now, the issue of insufficient collateral is about 30% of the reasons transactions for trade finance are being turned down in the African countries and especially in Nigeria. Again, the, the issue of um, high cost of funds. Now, not all in, uh, intervention programs or trade finance are from development banks. Uh, now the bigger players who are the commercial banks tend to price their, their funds so high. So you see interest rates ranging from 20 to 30% for a loan. Now, typically trade finance transactions tend to have uh, lower margins or slimmer margins because it's a volume business. So with this high cost of fund, it becomes unattractive for the SMEs to even uh, uh, try to access this funding. Now that could be from the part of the SMEs, but again, even the banks, some of them tend to shy away from uh, engaging in trade finance activities simply because they believe uh, trade-based um, regulations surrounding money laundering and KYC uh, and also KYC compliance are too expensive to implement and then they are discouraged in engaging in some of these uh, trade finance activities. But again, another consideration is, uh, is that the banks themselves who are willing to engage in uh, trade finance might have limited uh, capital. That is, there is insufficient risk capital to even lend to the SMEs and therefore they are constrained by uh, the amount of capital available for them to lend to, to the banks, I mean, to the SMEs. So these are some of the challenges, but basically the main challenge surrounding access to finance for SMEs in Nigeria is the lack of uh, ability to establish the credit worthiness, to do a due diligence on these customers due to uh, if.
information asymmetry, you know, lack of information on their activities, lack of uh, credit history and other things, and also the issue of collateral to back the request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Awami. I think this challenge of the, you know, the reason, main reason for the refusal of, for, of the financing application being this uh, lack of credit worthiness, it's probably a common challenge in most of the developing countries that, that we see. Now, in this aspect, how does your bank respond to alleviate these challenges? Okay, now, first of all, we try to create a lot of awareness. Uh, before COVID, we used to organize what we call the Exporter Enlightenment Forum, you know, where we go to different regions of the country and um, organize seminars and workshops uh, educating the SMEs about uh, products and services, informing them of the documentation requirements and things they need to put in place to get a bankable application. But then with the coming of COVID and, and the restriction on physical meetings, the bank set up uh, a digital academy called NEXA, that's NEXIM Export Academy. Now the digital academy is also aimed at enlightening the public on the various activities of the banks in terms of the products and services it offers, how loans can be accessed, the documentation requirements, and then how you can tailor your request to suit your particular need. And also training sessions are also organized online to further enlighten and educate people on how to access these funds. Now, in addition to that, we have also set up an SME unit within the bank you know, to address some of these challenges you know, in terms of uh, documentation requirements that are needed for SMEs. We tend to have watered it down a bit for them to make them uh, sort of include them in the, in, in the financing and make them able to provide the requirements. And then in terms of also uh, the interest rates and uh, other requirements, we tend to have watered it down. I mean, we give SMEs loans at, an, at a single digit interest rate just to encourage them. And then of course, then that would help enable, I mean, establish some form of um, uh, due diligence on them or credit worthiness. But in the issue of collateral, what we have done is to look at other forms of collateral that are available to the SMEs. Now the, the collateral registry has just been set up in Nigeria for movable uh, assets to be registered as collaterals. So we encourage them to you know, take advantage of that. They could register their movable assets and use them as collaterals for uh, bank loans. We also tend to um, structure transactions around the trade itself so that the, the, the assets or commodities being financed become the security for the transaction. You know? And uh, in addition to that, the bank is also working with the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Financial System Strategy 2020, and other development partners to help uh, establish a regulatory framework for factoring in Nigeria. You know, once that is done, we believe there will be more access to finance for the SMEs since there will be a, a factory market where they could sell their receivables and obtain financing. And also uh, to check the issue of um, credit worthiness, we are also working with the same uh, FSS 2020 to set up uh, a rating agency for SMEs, you know, where you can uh, get, they can get their credit scores and based on that, they can improve their credit worthiness to the banks and in their application. So when you have a, a rating or a score from this agency, you know, there's a certain kind of a level of confidence that comes with that. So these are some of the things uh, we're doing at Nexen. Thank you, Mr. Rami. I think these are extremely encouraging to see that type of the activities that the Nigerian Exim Bank is implementing in support in particular of SME, and especially this idea of the SME unit and providing the loan at the single digit level of the interest rate. This is basically helping also those businesses to have the credit records and histories that they would require in acquiring some other sort of the source of financing outside. So that is an excellent initiative that you're doing. Also for this credit worthiness rating agencies. I think that is something, a very important uh, the approach. 
And also perhaps, perhaps Gene Exit is already thinking about it, but this rating to be harmonized or coordinated across countries so that the businesses among developing countries would be much easier by sharing the information or the credit worthiness in different developing countries. I think this is a very exciting idea and I congratulate you with this coming up with this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would like to invite my colleague Diana. Diana, you conducted a study assessing the role of public banks in mitigating negative impact facing developing countries during the times of the COVID crisis. Would you like to, uh, um, what are the key findings from the study? Diana, you have the floor. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Miho. And thank you, everyone who gathered here today to hear our presentation. Um, as you may be aware, Ankh has been working on the theme of development banks and public banks for, for a long time, um, convinced by the evidence and the theory about the potentially essential role that they can play, making a distinctive, different contribution in the financial system. Um, in the slide that you can see now, I show you, for example, the latest trade and development report from my division, Globalization and Development Studies, which is devoted over the last couple of years, chapters to the role of public banks and development banks. And uh, we've also carried out work on South-South finance. And this is really a complement to the work of my colleagues, um, Miho in the uh, DITC and also in D DTL, where you know, UNCTAD does have this integrated approach and the way that we look at development banks, I think is you know, it's a, a great sign of that. So I'm very happy to, to share our work today. Um, before I get into the details, um, Miho, if you don't mind, if I can just um, put it in a bit of a context where you know, policymakers and governments and business, importers and exporters and, and businesses that focus entirely on domestic economy, all of these actors are facing really a cascade of crises right now. There's a series of COVID-related crises that are, are still far from over. And we now have new additional shocks stemming from the war of Ukraine plus the threat of rising interest rates. At the same time, rising demands to meet the sustainable development goals and to promote development and raise incomes. And on top of that, adjusting to climate change and hopefully mitigating climate change. So you know, what are the tools that government has at their disposal to help face these multiple and intersecting crises? And we're talking just about one in particular, which is the role of, of public banks. But I think it's important to think that public banks really are you know, part of the whole system. It's a whole government system. So we need to think about that you know, as an integrated way. Um, what my colleague, I see she's just put on the chat. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, we wanted to put two links uh, for you to, to read, get some further information that I can do now. Um, they're both available for free. The one is a, a short review, and that one is for free only for the next month, after which it goes onto a firewall by the publisher. So if you're interested, I suggest please download it soon rather than later. Um, anyway, what I wanted to think about, the what do we learn from the COVID experience, this COVID shock, and how do we use that as a broader lens to think about the role that development finance institutions can play to meet these growing needs in these intersecting crises that I've just mentioned. So boosting trade, which I know is an important element for, for many in the audience today, I mean, that's a major part of it, a major part of inclusive growth, but there's more to it than that. It's not only about trade, as, as I know everyone um, is well aware. So the first um, thing that we've learned, the first lesson really from the COVID experience thus far, and as I say, it's not over yet, um, but what we've learned so far is that governments and public banks, development banks, are the ones at the front line in defense. And it's good to be reminded about that. Because I think that there is a rhetoric, there is a, a narrative where we think that the private sector and private finance is going to be the solution. And it's very important to note that nobody expected the private sector or private banks to take the lead during this crisis. We did not expect them to bail out households. We did not expect them to help struggling importers or exporters. There's good reasons for this, but the future of our societies depends on learning the lessons that we've learned now, remembering that. And two other contextual factors we want to think about. And one is that COVID did not strike upon a world economy that was otherwise in good shape. 
So on the contrary, we in UNCTAD have long been worried about excessive deregulation and hyper-financialization and globalization that's left the world economy in this very unbalanced, inequitable and precarious state. So the public banks, that the, the speakers that we've heard today so far and the public banks that I'll be discussing now, they have this essential role, but that role was there also before COVID pulled back the curtains. It's just that COVID has made us see more clearly the fragility and their need. And the second thing, obviously, is that the shock of COVID has been seen as a warning you know, of other challenges and potential disasters that lie ahead. So much is going to be expected of our public banks. The two banks that we've heard of heard from this morning, just now, much will be expected of them and all the other important export banks in, their, um, in that category and also development banks. Their heavy lifting is starting. It's by no means over. So the lessons that we've learned from this COVID experience really need to be taken on board. I have the next slide, please. So just thinking for a moment about why we think public banks are important. There's sometimes a sense that public banks are secondary in the system or they're not really so important. Or, um, there's been, uh, you know, there's blue sky thinking now about public banks, but this is relatively uh, recent and it's come about partly because of the lessons in the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. But let's just remember that public banks are many and large. There's more than 900 public banks in the world, according to our research, and they hold this was in 2020, almost $50 trillion in assets. And they have accumulated expertise and institutional legacy. Many of them are hundreds of years old and they were born in crises in many cases. So they have long been there to fill the role that uh, the market, the private sector cannot fulfill by itself. And I think one of the most important things that we think about with public banks is that they have this special role which has been given political legitimation. They're historically unique financial institutions that have a special role to command money and also to command time. They can create time. And this is very important in times of crisis, but it's also very important for long-term and risky investments, such as infrastructure, where the bank steps in and is able to help either create time or balance time between the competing needs of people in the economy. So the banks were particularly important in the first few months of COVID because the lockdown, which was most countries' uh, primary immediate response to COVID, that led very quickly to a crisis of liquidity. The firms that had been viable before COVID, they suddenly found themselves without operational finance or without reserves to pay loans, salaries. Exporters found themselves unpaid for products that were stuck in ports and not collected, and importers had pre-sold goods that they could not access. So there is a problem here of time and money where public banks had to play an important role. Local authorities and even governments also face huge unanticipated and unbudgeted expenses. So we used to think that you know, one couldn't stop the economy rapidly, quickly. This is a shock to us that we could actually do this. There's this idea that economies are like super tankers, they take a very long time to move. But actually, we stopped things really, really fast. The difference, though, with an economy and a super tanker is that the, the ship basically does not change its, uh, its intrinsic nature by being stopped, whereas an economy does. And that is the big danger that the public banks had this important role to try and, and uh, stop. So, what happened February 2020? What starts as a health shock becomes very rapidly an economic and financial one with record flows of capital in and out of financial markets and foreign exchange markets ricocheting wildly, interrupting productive processes and employment everywhere. And at the same time, local and federal governments are facing a decline in revenue just when they need it most. And I think it's important to note that even countries that did not have confirmed cases of the virus or who did not do lockdown, they still suffered those economic effects of contagion. And to unlock this, it was public and development banks that exercised their capacity to create money and also to create time and command where it could go. Can I have the next slide, please? So what I want to see on this slide is just very quickly, 
how we moved from a health crisis to an economic crisis. This is taken from the Trade and Development Report of last year. And what we see very quickly, the green bars here, are the roles of banks, and for the most part, public banks. I think this is entirely public banks. And what we see is that they have very important uh, contribution in terms of the government role in combating the economic shock. Now, what individual countries did varied according to the depth of their pockets and the context of their unique political economies. Japan, for example, by August 2020, that's only a few months after the start of lockdown, Japan had spent as much as 50% of its GDP on a variety of different packages. Uh, Germany had spent as 40%. The United States had spent almost 30%. Developing countries, which are the ones that we're seeing on the right-hand side of this chart, because of the, you'll see they have much lesser capacity to respond, less than 5% of GDP in most cases. But this is not to say that they did nothing, and I'm very uh, interested to share with you what we found that, that they did do. But I think it's very important for the moment, let's think why the public banks are so important in these contributions. And it's because public banks are located in the public sphere. They're owned by governments or they're controlled by governments. And they have a legally binding public purpose, often uh, according to public law. So they're situated within a sphere which is very different from the private and commercial banks. This gives them the potential, not always, um, not always, but it gives them the potential, if not the necessity, to be different from the private banks. They don't have to be governed by commercial market imperatives, and they don't have to follow short-term profit-maximizing horizons of shareholders. So this is what makes their role so powerful. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we did. So we are sitting here my team sitting here in Geneva, everybody sitting around the world, May 2020, most of us at home, stuck at home in lockdown. And we realized that the public banks were being called on to, to, to play this unique role, a crisis role, and we wanted to understand it better. And at that time, the context was so raw and so fluid, there was no established knowledge or literature about what everybody was doing. So UNCTAD, in collaboration with Eurodad and with the Municipal Services Project in Canada, we three institutions uh, spearheaded this major research effort, working from some of us, our kitchen tables, most of us working from home, to try and understand better what was happening. It was the first effort uh, to try and document and reflect upon what banks were doing. And we brought together a team of more than 24 researchers covering individual public banks all over the world and also four regional public bank and development finance associations. So between them, they covered 280 public banks. So we've covered more than 300 public banks in our, in our study. And our focus was on trying to understand really what the banks were doing in the very short term right now. It was a very difficult task as the ground was shifting constantly. Programs that were announced often weren't put in place straight away. Some new programs were just old programs that were being repackaged and fast forwarded. And what seemed like a very bold program would be superseded just weeks later by something even more bold. So it was a very tumultuous time. And in our study, I think we have got this unique perspective. I should say that we, we're also, you know, this is not the end of the work. So we are right now in the process of um, following up the study that I'm about to present the results of in 2022, and we're also ongoing work with the Finance and Common Initiative, looking at the counter-cyclical role of public banks. So may I have the next slide, please? So we learned five really promising lessons from the review. The first thing is that a rapid response is possible. As I mentioned, because public banks are in the public sphere, they can re respond very, very quickly when they as a public need. So this is extremely significant. In most cases, initiatives start within weeks. Within weeks, so it's very, very fast. The public banks that we interviewed, they said we, were, we, we didn't sleep for one month. They were working night and day, trying to pull together the tools that could be used to help support the economy. Even sometimes, sometimes taking a completely different direction from their normal direction in a new change in policy. 
the public to a fast response was possible. And the second was that the mandate, the public purpose mandate was absolutely essential. When it was clear, they could respond very quickly. When it was ambiguous, things were much more difficult. The responses were less effective and they were slower. The third lesson was that you need to be bold and generous. I would say this is also a lesson that was learned in the 1930s, which we talk about in the, in the trade and development report that I have um, sent you the link for. Bold and generosity is what's needed in a crisis, not eating things um, out in a, in a small level. The fourth lesson was the importance of history, that institutional capacity and legacies really matter. So the countries that already had development banks in place were able to respond very fast. The ones where banks were new and at the present didn't have um, those uh, lines of communication clearly set up, if things are more difficult. And finally, this idea of public-public solidarity or South-South solidarity was not just a mantra. You really do see in the examples of the banks we see that there's advantages of a non-competitive public cooperation amongst institutions, between public banks and governments, between public banks at the national level and the multilateral level, for example, because it's guided by political direction, not the short-term imperative of profit maximization. So I'll take a, a break for a moment. I think, Miho, you wanted to come back in. Thank you, Diana. I think this was really interesting. You know, the finding from your systematic assessment of the public development banks and this important role that they played was really very much based on or anchored in this their publicness in a sense that the like legitimacy and the stability that they can offer being the public body. Um, having had these you know sort of the broad ideas and the five key findings from the study, do you would you like to share some examples? of the type of the activities that some public public banks did uh, based on your country cases or some case studies. Thank you, Miho. Yes, I do have a slide for that. <laughs> Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what did the public banks do? I, we found, in fact, all the banks that we interviewed, everyone said they wanted to provide relief and recovery and they wanted to provide it fast. Some were able to do it more than others, but the point is that all of them saw it as their role. So I've put here on this chart a, um, a whole bunch of different things that, that they did. They provided loans, they provided guarantees, they provided short-term liquidity cover, they provided longer-term cover in some places, mortgage holidays. Um, it, it, there's a huge amount of different things that they did. Guarantees was one of the most frequently used instruments, especially for banks that were not so well capitalized at the time. And um, restructuring, so debt restructuring was also a major instrument that was used. But in many cases, banks did also go into uh, doing new loans. Some were able to be concessional, some were not. The countercyclical role is what's really important. It's really standing out. And by countercyclical, I mean banks that lent more than in the non-COVID period. Counter-cyclical also in the sense that they went in the direction that's different from what the private banks were doing. So many of the banks significantly increased their lending in 2020 compared to 2019, filling the need. Quite a lot of the ones we interviewed had enormous increases. The Asian Infrastructure Bank, for example, increased its commitments by 100%. The National Development Banks in Uganda and Nigeria have increases of 70 and 90%. The Turkey Industrial Bank increasing by 50%. And in Korea, the Development Bank and Import-Export Banks each going up by 25%. So banks everywhere were trying to increase lending. What we did see in some cases was that commitments went up significantly, but disbursements did not go up because disbursement was difficult. Not all banks were able to make the transition to digitalization, for example. This was really important in a lockdown situation where people could not go in to visit branches and branches were not open either. So
So many banks faced challenges in terms of disbursement. Another issue was that many banks, their function was not to provide liquidity. They had functions that were geared more to long-term lending like infrastructure. So more than one of the banks that we interviewed said, if we had continued to fund only infrastructure, which is our purpose, we would have no clients because nobody was interested in doing infrastructure during COVID. Banks, um, banks were there with the funds potentially, but the clients were not there. And governments were preoccupied obviously with the front line of COVID response. So some banks, they, they, they'd say, we could not keep our role. We could not function if we did not change and offer liquidity services to our clients. And in fact, this was in their interest in the long run because it kept the economy rolling and it was keeping their clients rolling. So they could not take the risk of doing nothing. So the instruments varied a lot, we found amongst different banks. Um, grants were offered in some special sectors, for example, to the tourism sector or to vulnerable households, but guarantees for many banks was the most important role. Supporting government ministries also was a new role for some banks, lending directly to local authorities or to government. Um, lowering capital requirements was one way of increasing lending to corporates, lowering interest rates in some cases, but not all, and restructuring of existing loans. So then the big question is, well, where did they get the finance? And I think we heard already from our previous speakers that uh, constrained, uh, constraints of finance was a major challenge for many banks. And in the banks that we interviewed, a few were recapitalized by their governments. The Kabai in Latin America, for example, gained an additional 40% in capitalization. The National Bank of Uganda, the government doubled its capitalization. But in many other cases, what happened rather was that the role of the bank was to implement funds that were given to it by government. So the one-off um, one transfer of funds from government and the role of the bank then is to use its expertise and diligence to lend it. Many banks tried to raise additional funds on the international markets, and some were able to do this very successfully with bond issues that created billions of dollars on their, on their books, but others were hampered by the fact that they needed sovereign guarantees to be able to ra raise funds or the sovereign credit rating was often too low to attract finance at rates that were um, attractive. Can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned before, when I, we said the five lessons- Diana, sorry, I think I have to ask you to wrap up the oh, presentation, sure. oh. yes, on the benefit of others. In that case, well, I'll just wrap up very, very quickly by saying that when banks had a promising public purpose, um, it was very clear and they could roll out funds very, very quickly. I think maybe let's say one of the most important lessons I would say from this is the political support, support from the owners of the banks. That was really, really important because credit rating agencies understand if banks have got their political support and also the banks have the confidence that they will be backed up when they make their lending. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. This was really interesting. Thank and you. it's really a good news that, uh, you know, we have these, uh, you have shared the links to these studies and the people who want to get into the details can actually have an access and enjoy the, the, the work that was con good work conducted by you and the team, Diana. Thank you very much. Yeah. At this stage, probably, dear panelists, do you have questions or comments to your fellow panelists? May I invite if anyone? Yes, yes, Mr. Sharma. So, uh, you know, fascinating. I think, uh, you know, the points made by Mr. Abami earlier and uh, Ms. Baratrao, uh, the study was very, very sobering. I think some of the points that came out, uh, perhaps on reflection, it's one of the reasons why we introduced this new program. Because if you don't evolve, uh, you cease to exist. Uh, and, and we needed to start doing something more beyond our normal mandate to push things. Uh, but very quickly on, uh, you know, after these observations, one point to Mr. Avami is, how are you now looking at information asymmetry? And, you know, that's a challenge that uh, uh, developing countries face. Uh, so uh, do you have, uh, uh, you know, a technology mechanism or, or something else to sort of bridge the gap in information asymmetry? And, and one question to Ms. Baraklov, uh, 
uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what do you see, uh, uh, you know, is this a re evolving role or this is just something that you saw during a time of crisis or you think that, you know, this is going to play out better in terms of how banks are evolving to do a little more than their normal mandate? Thank you, Mr. Sharma. So there's a question to Mr. Awami. Hello, Sharma. I didn't quite want to be some break in the, the, the network is about a little bit dropping, but I'd get your question. Could you please um, repeat it once more? Sure. Uh, the uh, question was on information asymmetry. So we've seen, you know, particularly when working with MSMEs, uh, we've had this huge challenge, particularly, you know, in developing countries like India. Uh, we've seen that play a huge uh, uh, challenge for us to support MSMEs. So how are you dealing with that, uh, uh, you know, back in Nigeria? Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I get the question. Very now, good. What... So Mr. Awami, yes, yes, go mm. ahead. Take it, now, please. Um, the, the SME unit we created also provides uh, business and advisory services to these uh, SMEs, you know. So we uh, package their applications, you know, advise them on the type of facilities they can. And um, sometimes we even go further and uh, look at their business model, for solutions to them, and then tell them what and what they need to do. Most of these are structured, some of them are registered even. So we encourage them to structure their businesses, to uh, engage in, the activities that will make them a formal, you know, and even undertake exports through the formal channels. You know, there's a lot of unrecorded trade, you know, so to do all this things so that they can build a track record, you know, something that can be a reference point for them in trying to establish their credit worthiness. So it has to do with a lot of awareness creation and um, advice to these companies. That is and then, like I said, we put up a digital academy where we offer all this advice and create more awareness. We do physical when we can, if it's permitted. And then um, we uh, we also, like I said, advocating for the establishment of a written agency for the SMS, which will further, you know, close is identified in trying to establish their credit worthiness things that uh, we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Wami. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if we have lost. Oh, okay, you are there. And thank you very much indeed. Are you continuing? No, I think that's the conclusion of your answer to Mr. Sharma, yes? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. And Diana, there was a question from Mr. Sharma on you whether the, you know, this study's finding is really based on what the public banks have been doing all the time, or it's a kind of the evolving mm -hmm. feature. Mm -hmm. Diana, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So it's a really important question. Um, so, you know, are banks evolving? And should they be evolving? This is a question. So, yes, I think the banks are evolving in the, in the light of two things. One is that, you know, this crisis really required, um, required banks to sometimes retool their set or to, uh, to redirect their, um, their goals and their strategies. And the banks that, that did this, obviously they did this with the approval of, of the, the support of their owners. And that's very important in our study, that's what we found. Um, but the point is too that, um, you know, we, it's a question also of the mandates and the political expectations of the banks in the, in the sphere in which they are. So it's not necessarily a good thing if all banks changed and if all banks tried to do everything. I mean, I think it would, um, our research suggests that it's better to have, you know, a diversity of banks because you need expertise and precise knowledge. You know, the people that were running an export import bank wouldn't necessarily be the people that should run an infrastructure bank, for example. It's, you know, a great deal of knowledge that goes into, into this as well. But I think what's particularly interesting, and, um, you know, it strikes me from your example of India, as you mentioned, that you, your bank found it very difficult to meet those, the challenges and the needs. In fact, if you, I do hope that you will read the rapid review, which is in our link here, because we did find that, you know, India was a very particular, um, particular example 
where, you know, it's a cautionary tale actually about the importance of the mandate and the public purpose. Because there's a, there was an inconsistency between what was expected of the public banks and the macroeconomic situation in which you know, they're embedded. So historically, you know, India had a, had a very strong tradition of, of um, public banks playing a very public role, but that has changed over time and they are now um, expected more to be delivering profit and to be following, um, following a path which is maybe not so different from some of the commercial banks. And so when something like COVID strikes, even though what we found, for example, even though the Indian government was augmenting the funds made available to banks, they weren't always able or willing to lend it um, because they're already burdened with, with defaults from, from other loans. So credit growth actually did not pick up in that those critical COVID months. And in fact, credit growth fell, whereas in other countries, credit growth is, is increasing. So, so I think you know the point is that the banks might evolve, but what also needs to evolve is the political support for the bank and the framework in which in which they exist. And um, the second thing is the question of capitalization, because they, you know, it's one thing to have the mandate, but you also still need to have available, robust, reliable capital in which to do it. And um, that's another thing we found with our banks that some that were heavily undercapitalized for what they needed were not able to support the most vulnerable sectors of their economy. In some countries, tourism, for example, which had been a really vital sector, now suffering, of course, because of lockdown, and they were giving zero loans to tourism because they didn't have the capital and couldn't afford to take the risk. So, you know, there's a, a needs to be congruence between the expectation of the bank and the tools that it has at its capacity to use for purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. It's really great to have this interactive discussion on each other. Um, but given that we only have we have less than 30 minutes, I just would like to invite everyone to go to the second round of the panel discussion. And in this round, I ask the same question to the, each panelist. What are the key lessons learned? Or what are the you know, way forward taking into account of what we have learned so far? What are the key messages and what would be the way forward? Also, at the same time, I realized that in the chat box that we have received the specific questions or the comment probably from Ms. Saki from South Africa, who mentioned that, you know, when, what kind of supports are available to women owned agro processing businesses. So particularly in these agro businesses, which happen to be a major export sectors of many developing countries. If you have some examples that uh, really support these women on agro-processing businesses, please also include in your, your, your uh, intervention. I just want to say at this moment also that there was a question um, and there, you know, there was a huge appreciation of the presentation that you used and whether these presentations would be available. Yes, we'll make them available on the website of the event website of this uh, uh, the session. I think uh, my colleague can again share the, the link to this website. And after the meeting, the presentation will be available on the site. So um, may I probably start with Mr. Awami on this final question and perhaps your, you know, if there's any example of support targeting at the women on the agro processing businesses. Mr. Wami, you have the floor. Uh, okay. I think I got the last part of the question. Uh, it seemed to be having some bandwidth uh, challenges. But yes, at uh, Nexim, what we've done is um, even within the SME unit, we have sort of created a subunit to support women and youths who are into uh, exports and wish to access trade finance. So there's a deliberate, you know, uh, intention to to support uh, those uh, sectors or those uh, categories that we consider vulnerable. So yes, we have. A spare, I mean, like forty percent of the funds in the SME is dedicated to women and youths, and uh, we have a similar uh, program also under the uh, oil and gas uh, services sector, that um, uh, which is a fund we are managing for the local content development board of Nigeria. 
So also under that fund, about $20 million is dedicated specifically for women in oil and gas. So there are deliberate um, programs that we do uh, undertake to support women in uh, accessing trade and finance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diana, uh, I think, well, this is probably not so much. Did you come across with some of the examples focusing probably on the women entrepreneurs in your study in the public banks? What we found when, in some of the public banks, they were focusing not in the immediate, not, not in those first few COVID months. Um, in general, there's one or two examples, one or two exceptions where, yes, that was a, an important thing. But generally, they were looking at all industries, at all SMEs. They were just trying to respond very, very fast. Um, things get more nuanced over time. And, for example, we found quite a few banks where they would uh, particularly focus on a sector where women were particularly highly represented. Um, so the sector was considered particularly vulnerable. And um, there's also a number of examples where they were lending to, to households and families. And I guess that is, um, a lot of that is to women, but it wasn't uh, phrased, it wasn't sort of phrased like that. Um, what we then saw over the next year is that in some cases, the emergency lending was starting to be targeted more to, to green topics. So the banks were trying to align their COVID lending with their, um, their green commitments. But um, that's not in, that's only in a few a few cases. Okay. Thank you, Diana. Can I turn to the question about you? You asked us what was the main lesson, or do you want? Are you still? Perhaps we make, let us just go around on this uh, specific question. Then we come back to this uh, final, you know, the, the lessons learned and uh, way forward. Mr. Sharma, would you you be in a position to share your experience with respect to the women entrepreneurs, particularly in the agro-processing businesses? You know, in India, uh, we're a very large and diverse economy as, uh, uh, you know, Ms. Vanekla would have seen in her, uh, uh, you know, study. It, it's very, very uh, uh, different in, in our ways and means. And when we look at women entrepreneurs or, uh, you know, particularly in the agro space, uh, we've seen a lot of social organizations come together and uh, look at, uh, you know, a variety of products and also processing thereof. Uh, we've seen that there is a huge impact during COVID time. So what we started doing is that can we help them uh, in capacity building? Uh, so we've looked at, looked at two forms of support. One is through uh, technical assistance. And the other is through bringing in experts for helping them build capacity. So there are these, and there are these communities across India, across various uh, uh, you know regions in India, where this has helped very significantly. So uh, a simple form of financing is something that is not directly benefiting them. But when we are doing a TA and helping them build capacity, we are seeing that they are able to source orders, get orders, and and these are not from uh, partner developing countries, but these may be even from advanced economies. So for them to risk mitigate in a trade transaction is not entirely there. So it's a little different than the experience that we saw uh, in terms of, you know, how we need to support such, uh, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs in the agro space. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Since we do also have the Ghana Exim Bank, I don't know, Mr. Misa, I do. Would you like to intervene here and share your experience also? Yes, um, listening to Mr. Awami um, sounded virtually like he was talking about Ghana, uh, but uh, we are sister nations. So um, what happens on Ghana, in Ghana, you get a skill factor five happening in Nigeria. Um, I, my, in my previous, um, I started development banking about five years ago. I was director of finance of a commercial bank. So I understood his um, comment about availability of credit to the SMEs and especially businesses led by women. I, I dare to say at that time, the issue was not really about collateral. It was really about 
having a basis for even the credit analyst to show to his uh, uh, superiors that this person is making this level of turnover. So on that basis, we can lend to support the business. They were not banking. The, um, there was virtually nothing to use as a basis for the credit. So it made it, even in some cases where you wanted to help, even without collateral, but there was no basis and you can't lend in a vacuum. So for Ghana um, to help in that regard, the government has issued the national ID card. And this national ID card is now your tax ID card. When you want to open a bank account, it is the only means by which you can use. If you want to have a phone, a mobile phone, it is the only ID that you can use. Now it is being used even as a traveling document. The, the, when you want to register a business, that is the only ID card that you can use. We are getting to the space where we can just by picking your card, your ID number. In fact, it's even becoming your pension number, your pension ID. Uh, eventually we are linking it to your driver's license. So that's one number. Once you call up that num number, you can virtually see the person's banking tra transactions and everything. Yes, it will help the government raise tax revenue and everything, but of critical importance is that we will be able to know your banking records. Even if you are doing that banking transactions on the phone, just by calling up that ID, we can see the regularity or the volume of business that you're doing on your phone. So it can be used as a basis for lending. The next bit about the difficulty in availing credits to SMEs was the address system. I remember in, 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 uh, when I was in the private sector, somebody gave us his address. And when we checked, when we went to the place to look at it, it was the electricity pole. Yes, I can see the surprise in your face. The, the address that the person gave us was an electric pole. So the government has invested more than $10 million in making sure our address system, you can just by giving you that address, we can punch and then we can actually view where you claim you live, even if it's a rented premises. So um, this is one of the areas because like you said, 82% of African businesses are led by um, um, SMEs. And then I came for um, uh, one, one session at WTO and we realized that majority, the businesses that employ about 80, more than 80% of the world's population are businesses of about four and a half people. So it is important that micro businesses, SMEs are supported. And that is the, that is the way that uh, we are heading towards. And like I said, we, Ghana Exxon Bank, uh, we are, today we are having a Tuesday market. The main focus is for, we are giving a platform to small scale businesses, especially led by women, to come and exhibit their platform. We are located at where a lot of the, where the central bank is located, the British Council. We are located within an enclave where we have about six banks head offices. So all of them will congregate. There is music, there is food local. So we are just giving them a platform. At our own cost, you exhibit us uh, at no cost. And we are helping them to give them a platform to exhibit their wares and, for, and to help them um, um, generate good business for themselves. We've also sponsored some of them recently to the Fruit Logistica. We sponsored some of them to trade fairs and shows and so on and so forth to help build capacity. If there is one thing that COVID taught us is that we must uh, help uh, strengthen the backbone of local businesses because eventually when all the borders are shut, they are the ones that, that help to hold us all, all up. And that is the direction in which we are moving as a, as a bank. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for, for all this experience and then the information from the ground in Ghana. I just have to let you know that I'm a big fan of the Ghana's traditional sauce, shito. So if you uh, know a good export <laughs> of shito, <laughs> let us know good, also. Good, good. <laughs> now, at this stage, I think we just, uh, the, we go to the final question and also it's gonna be your final word. And I asked you about what are the main, you know, key takeaways from this discussion and also what could be the way forward. Um, perhaps I'd ask Diana you first and then followed by Mr. Awami and uh, Mr. Sharma, then uh, Mr. Amisa Aidu I from the perspective of the GNX as a whole. So Diana, please go ahead. We have 10 minutes. So I think each one has around two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. So uh, just very briefly, then, what I would say is that, you know, what we see in the COVID relief and recovery role of the public banks gives us um, some insights as to what we need to do now for moving forward for the SDGs and the low carbon pledges that have been made by most governments of the world. There's a transition and a transformation that's required, and public banks will be absolutely part of that. So the first thing that I think is really obvious is that scaling up of their financial capacity is essential. And whether this comes through increased capitalization from governments, um, there's a lot of discussion right now about SDRs and how they can be used. And that's very exciting for public banks. Um, so this, this question about how to scale up is absolutely has to, be, has to be on the cards. But at the same time, to keep banks distinctive and different, they don't have to all be the same. And the fact that they are owned by the public doesn't necessarily make them public spirited. So really we need to enable the public banks to, to be aligned to their public purpose. And in fact, to pull them more and more towards public purpose and not to try and have them fulfill the role that private banks can actually do very well. So I think what I would say here is that banks need adequate capital and they need policy space to fulfill that role. And the policy space comes from their government owners, who are the ones who require them to uh, perform in particular ways or who evaluate what they have done and judge their performance. And also that provides the macroeconomic environment in which these banks are trying to operate. And it's very difficult to be an expansionary public bank if your macroeconomic environment is going in a different direction. Um, also, there's obviously the need for a multilateral environment to be supportive. And, some of the cases that we found some banks were working able to scale up a lot because they were worked in collaboration with multilateral banks so for example the asian infrastructure uh, bank worked in collaboration with national banks so that was that meant that they could do a lot um, so the role of public banks is not it's not just to de-risk the private sector's initiatives okay it's not just to fill gaps i think it's bigger than that it's like catalytic and it creates a role and you know, it can really, um, it can guide finance. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. So Mr. Awami, I invite you. Uh, thank you. Now, listening to all the presentations, especially from uh, Diana and uh, Sharma, I totally agree with what um, Diana has said. In fact, I was thinking in the same line, you know, uh, in Nigeria, you know, as uh, COVID relief and recovery measures, the central bank uh, instructed public banks, you know, banks like mine, Nexim Bank, to extend moratorium to uh, on, on loans that we have given, and also to further even reduce the interest rates from nine percent to five percent as a recovery measure. I mean, a relief and recovery measure for, for COVID. So it is very clear that the public banks and the development finance uh, institutions are more responsive when it comes to uh, issues of um, recovery and economic growth in, in, in times of uh, challenges and other things. And so there is definitely that need to boost their capacity in terms of um, making more funds available to them for them to carry out their mandate and also diversifying their product offerings. You know, like, like I said earlier on, we are trying to advocate for the setting up of a factoring uh, framework in Nigeria so that it's not just um, giving financing, but you could be you know, 
buying debts of companies, you know, their receivables, which is a huge market also, so that there are various sources of uh, financing available to the SMEs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Awami. I now would like to invite Mr. Sharma for his final word. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, one comment that I had uh, on uh, the previous discussion also was in terms of our experience very recently on account aggregators. And what's happening in India is we're seeing that move in very quickly. So there are financial information providers and financial information users. So what happens is that individuals, everybody has a credit score. But when it comes to these small businesses, there's really no credit history. So by regional rural banks and uh, other agencies in rural pockets, uh, providing information to non-banking financial companies through an account aggregator model, we'll see more credit flow to them. And that is something that we've seen uh, happen at the highest level, you know, even politically. So as we go along, I think in this calendar year, we'll see that move very, very rapidly in India. Uh, of course, coming back uh, to the topic under discussion, uh, you know, I had mentioned previously about uh, the significant gap in trade finance, uh, brought out by three areas, which is the economic crisis, the pandemic, and the current situation in Europe, which has sort of exasperated the issue at hand. Uh, we at the India Exim Bank feel that this is a significant opportunity for export credit agencies and DFIs to come in and, and bridge that gap in trade finance, even if in a small way to start with. And that's, a, that's, that's why the evolution of this program. Uh, additionally, what we've also seen is that we need to play this role in crowding in global banks and strengthening local institutions in various geographies. And particularly, you know, when we talk about challenging and untapped markets in the developing world. How do you strengthen uh, local institutions or, or develop these relationships? Uh, because sometimes banking or providing trade finance is more an art than a science, and we need to play this art well. Uh, the third point that I'd like to make is documentation, particularly legal structures in various geographies is very different and diverse. And uh, we've now tried to unify a uh, good standardized documentation uh, so that banks and institutions are able to come on board very, very quickly. Uh, pricing, again, is extremely critical. And oftentimes, uh, it's, uh, you know, it plays a very important role. Uh, so while we are all geared towards looking at, uh, you know, how do we uh, have a capital charge basis, but we've realized that uh, today, multilateral agencies and some uh, development banks also are looking to Sort of downplay that a bit and and look at volume targets rather than having pricing targets and we are moving the same space and we're seeing that that is helping the program to uh, do well uh, the next point is in terms of you know the multiplier effect that this program can bring in we've seen the likes of the asian development bank and ifc gradually increase the multiplier effect to about five to six times and there have been a number of uh, research reports even by the independent evaluation offices of other MDBs studying you know, their counterparts program. Uh, so what we've done is we've set a target of uh, two times for ourselves in terms of the multiplier effect that the program will bring in. So that will encourage uh, you know, in, suppliers to go and enter into newer markets just by seeing what is happening under the program and not necessarily through the program as well. Uh, also, in terms of, you know, a critical point that I'd like to make here is turnaround time is absolutely essential. Otherwise, trade transactions normally are lost. And we've seen a lot of new technology come on board. So we've seen blockchain and some, you know, other nice things. Uh, but for in a developing country context, sometimes that can be very expensive to uh, get onboarded onto that technology by using a service provider. And we've come to realize that we need a simple, adaptable uh, technology, uh, which is unified. So we've adapted that simplified technology at our end, rather than looking at something which is uh, you know, very advanced, 
because uh, you know developing countries will need to adapt to that quickly and we can turn around transactions very rapidly uh, the last point uh, over here is awareness of these programs oftentimes we've seen that uh, you know uh, msmes in the developing country context are not aware of some of these initiatives that uh, ecs and dfi take so we are making that effort uh, along with our partner institutions and today i'm happy to say that we've partnered with almost 100 institutions uh, across the globe uh, under the program uh, to spread out the word and say that yes here is something which can help you actually uh, contribute to global value chain thank you thank you very much mr sharma now mr misa i do um probably from the perspective of the g nexet in terms of increasing collaboration and cooperation among groups of different developing institutions, developing finance, inst development finance institutions and experts, what do you think would be uh, the important way forward? Um, yes, I will take it from um, Dinah's presentation, where she said, um, development banks such as exams and other development, quasi development institutions, are the institutions that are helping to really restore economics, economies and not the private sector banks. And um, if we are, if we all agree that development finance institutions are this important and they are the uh, virtually the pillars to help us restore, um, uh, help us move away from, we've had a, a health a challenge it has moved to an economic challenge and if it is development banks that are help that will help us to turn the corner then we must cooperate because if we work in silos um it will be a little bit more difficult and it will take too much time so in that regard um alexandro and the uh, genius uh, structure we've had uh, certain sessions we had a blockchain financing um, where we are looking at, uh, we looked at how development banks such as us could raise additional finance to help us support our SMEs even better. So what I'll say is that um, as GNZ, this is um, um, the platform that uh, we must use to tell ourselves what we need to do to help our economies move out of these current challenges is more cooperation and not uh, disaggregation. So let us uh, uh, together find innovative ways and also share best practices uh, because we are in this together. We are here we are in India, but what is happening, uh, is it in Southeast Asia or not in Europe is affecting us all. So when we cooperate, I think we can affect um, all businesses throughout the world. Thank you very much. Mayor. Thank you very much. So with this very positive note, we are going to close this session. My heartfelt thanks to all the panelists and the audience for a very stimulating and um, valuable discussion on this point, on this is important issue. And we at ANCTA look forward to increasing collaboration with GNEXIT and also the FFD community in really further assessing the synergistic linkages between this uh, not only trade but development financing and attainment of inclusive trade and sustainable development goals also at the end i'd like to thank my team sophie taiske mesut and jean philippe the team of ANCTAD who made this a session uh, who actually you know materialized the dream of having this session by their hard work and i really want to thank the team so with this, I'd like to close the session once again. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for participating in this session. The session is closed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.